This is Johnny Blue Star. Welcome to Threshold, a global media event. Is the universe just a random dance of atoms, or is it a manifestation of a supremely intelligent architect? Can its purpose, or our purpose here on Earth, be adequately assessed? Can we commune with it, know its intentions, cooperate with its direction? Here, we define threshold as a gateway state of awareness, allowing mankind to cross into a place of real cognition. Threshold allows us to approach questions of higher reality through the door of experience rather than mere belief. Welcome to Threshold, where we tear away the veil from commercial media, bringing our audience and participants into another realm of reality and enhanced communication. In the last hour, we talked about the presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and uh, Bernie Sanders, which was a very interesting, cordial debate. Now, this next debate, the Republican debate, supposedly was very cordial. Certainly, uh, Donald Trump's demeanor seemed to shift into a, a, a kind of at least restraint, if not politeness, that wasn't really experienced before. But we still had some very interesting things that were actually said, despite the, uh, the cordial way they were spoken. I uh, am interested in some of the uh, s- the statements about the economy uh, and some of the other statements that were fact-checked by CNN, because I re- also, when I heard him say that the c- GDP was zero essentially for the last two quarters, I wondered, because I haven't really noticed that it really was that way, and I was rewarded by finding out that at least CNN thought maybe it wasn't. It says, Trump erroneously said that the U.S. economy isn't growing. He said GDP was zero essentially for the last two quarters. If that ever happened in China, you would have had a depression like nobody's ever seen. They go down to 7%, 8%, and it's a national tragedy. We're at zero. We're not doing anything. CNN says, well, allow that he meant GDP growth, not the gross domestic product itself. But he was still wrong that the U.S. economy is continually was continually stalled. GDP growth came in at 1% during most of the recent quarter and 2% the quarter before. It's not going very well. Now, I've been reading uh, recently James Ricard, who basically is saying that GDP growth at like 1% is very, very bad. And in matter of fact, an underachieving economy with that type of growth could be said to be in a depression. Now, You know, people don't think we're in a depression. The fact is that there are a lot of jobs. When we talk about job rate in this country, they're not taking into consideration the people who have left the uh, seeking for a job through the official channels and are basically either doing it at their own or not doing it at all. Those people aren't considered to be, aren't considered in the unemployment statistics because they're considered not to be working. So they're not employed rather than unemployed, which is ridiculous. And for this reason, one of the things that will happen in my presidential fantasy campaign platform is that we'll start having real statistics, not statistics that make our uh, politicians look good or give a false idea of of our economy so that people feel comfortable and warm inside of them, even though all around them there are, are signs of really depressed economic activity. So... I think this is an extremely important point. We not only want to be transparent as much as we can. Obviously, there are things that should be classified, some of which are top secret, some of which are above top secret, I suppose. But whatever it is, whatever kind of classification we have, we want to do that minimally. We want to do what Kennedy said. We want to have a country that is not ruled by secret secrets. On the other hand, being transparent isn't good enough, because if we're not transparent and we're not honest, and our statistics are created to give an impression that is not real, then why bother? We don't want to have a situation in war or economics or in the development of certain programs that is not truthful. We need a totally different approach to the way government communicates with the public. And some of this could be also said to be about the, particularly during the Bush administration, the kind of climate change science that was being done. We don't want bad science. And we don't want to be focusing our attention 
on companies uh, supporting corporate ventures uh, directly or indirectly that are releasing information based on false science or based on non-objective ways of procuring research. Now, here I'm talking about the pharmaceutical companies, which basically are taking charge of a lot of their own research. And so you, what you see is not research done by government, by, but by the pharmaceutical companies themselves. And s many people have said that a lot of this research is quite biased, and uh, it's basically meant to cement their ability to get a certain type of patent. They have to spend millions, if not even maybe more than a billion dollars on some of this research which produces a, an impression. Oh, we've got a brand new drug. We've patented one from the uh, rainforest medicinals. It, it doesn't necessarily work without devastating side effects, but at least it's ours, and we can sell it and advertise it on TV as long as we list all the various side effects that occur. Well, we don't need bad science running things. Government should be taking more of a role in producing research that can do a real reality check on what's going on in an in industry like the pharmaceutical industry or also like the food industry. And, you know, again, what we have is what they call the revolving door effect, where you have the heads of many of these agencies coming out of uh, corporate companies and then going right back into them. This is a problem. Because, and it's connected with the kind of information that we get and people make judgments on because the people in charge have an instinctive bias unless they're really of high integrity. And speaking of high integrity, you know, this is like another aspect of the debate between Clinton and, and Bernie Sanders was that, you know, uh, yeah, you took $600,000 or something in one or probably one year or six or a couple of years from Goldman Sachs and you did a, um, some paid speeches that were quite expensive, maybe $150,000 for an hour. And you don't think you're, we don't think you're biased. Well, maybe you're not biased. Well, why won't you produce the, uh, the transcripts of those speeches? Why can't you let people see it? Well, if everybody does it, I will. Well, Bernie Sanders would because he doesn't have any. He'd produce it gladly for you. And the Republicans, why should you be asking them for those spe speeches? So again, you have a certain lack of transparency here. This transparency is taking, lack of transparency is taking place in your, uh, in your primary campaign. Uh, and this is not something maybe we can absolutely force somebody to do, but it just shows an indication of a lack of willingness to uh, be transparent and to have some kind of fact-checking around to see if maybe these speeches were kind of self-serving in terms of supporting the Wall Street industries that you try to attack. So, again, transparency and truth are both related. Furthermore, in terms of transparency and truth, you also have the problem of the administration basically creating a very, very chilling effect for the, uh, for the activities of investigative reporters because these people are subject to all kinds of, uh, shall we say, uh, assaults on their ability to carry out their work. And because of some of these laws, like the Patriot, Patriot Act, they are afraid of working with sources that might be considered to be related to uh, terrorism or either objectively or, or, or not so. And they, they are afraid of being possibly indicted under uh, the Patriot Act or having some of their people or their sources looked into because there is this blanket surveillance. And in some, certain cases, there's been uh, investigations that have been actually uh, surveyed specifically. So there is a sort of a chill going over the entire industry of reporting. So you have truth that needs to be respected, transparency, but you also need to respect the right of the press to inquire. And that is a very important protection. Free speech also means that people can speak freely, but they also will be allowed to use the tools of research without unwarranted fear of being investigated and possibly indicted for very serious things. So that's another problem. So all these things that we're saying, they're going back to the fact that certain things are being talked about in these primary debates where facts are being thrown around kind of loosely. And that kind of lack of factual approach to uh, very serious issues is a problem. It's a problem that the people who are conducting these debates 
are also using some of this false information and talking about problems in, in one way or, or another without really using objective facts that should be at their disposal. So what you have is you have a situation where everything, including the economy and the potential for different kinds of wars or military clashes are being distorted and argued about all the time. And in order for us to have a country that really functions as a democracy, as a representative democracy, uh, the, the representatives not only need to be supporting the views of the people, but they need to be bringing the people the right facts so that they can make a decision as to their competency and their roles. We're going to be right back in just a few minutes. Patricia Welch is clearly one of the most accomplished singers living today. Recently, she created a wonderful CD set called Great Entertaining, Cocktails, Dinner, and Dessert with Patricia. We have two complete shows with Patricia, show number four, Evolution of a Singer, and show number 14, Cocktails with Patricia. You can find them at our Threshold Radio archives at VegasOnNetRadio.com and YouTube. Here's one of her songs from her CD collection.
This is Johnny Blue Star. I've worked as a lyricist with Patricia Welsh for over five years, along with Russian composer Edgar Ahrens, a friend and colleague. Her ability as a singer is simply amazing. She brings a unique and dramatic flair to every song she sings. Over the next few months, we shall be releasing a number of these songs, part of an album called Hadley's Castle. Meanwhile, Patricia has been busy creating a super enjoyable collection of classic standards in an exciting 46-song, 3-CD collection. Music for great entertaining introduces cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia Welch. Three hours of continuous music. 46 of the all-time classic standards spanning decades of hit songs. Going to a friend's home for dinner? Cocktails, dinner, and dessert with Patricia also makes the perfect hostess gift. This three CD compilation is the perfect background music that sets just the right mood for any dinner party. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. To purchase this album, just go to patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. That is patriciawelch.com forward slash CD. You won't be disappointed. It is the 15th century. El Tesoro de Cielo, a Spanish treasure ship, sends a scouting expedition to a strange island. Golden statues surrounding them prove the enormity of their find. Suddenly, hordes of ghoulish creatures with scaly green flesh and skeletal wings descend upon them from the sky. What do you think of this, Rufio? These creatures are fragile, Captain. We can take them with our swords. They seem supernatural. Who knows what powers they possess? Fallen angels weakened by their treason. My God! Are you saying they're Nephilim, the devil's host? I'm saying whatever they are, we can take them. Do any of you cowards dare join me? Up against sharp knife-like nails and hideous fangs, the men's swords rip into slimy green flesh. Though black blood pours copiously from their half-naked bodies, creatures miraculously persist. Can the crew survive this bloody, cursed battle? Find out more by googling The Thrice Born, a new sci-fi supernatural novel by Carlos Lopez Avery and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Carlos Johnny Kendall, The Thrice Born. That's Carlos Johnny Kendall, The Thrice Born. Hi, uh, this is Johnny Blue Star back on Threshold talking about my fantasy presidential campaign platform and I want to return to this question of these uh the kind of trade agreements that I want. Now, here's uh, one of the problems. I like Bernie Sanders' approach to wanting to restore our economy. We lost our manufacturing sector largely, as Donald Trump points out, thousands of factories not being uh, functioning anymore, a tragedy for the people who worked in this country, and perhaps an aid to people in other countries who would be continue to be paid on, in a way that is pennies on the dollar compared to what we have to make here. Now, some of this concept has to be adjusted for the different kind of currencies and their buying power. But basically, Sanders would say, yeah, we're giving up our manufacturing capacities to other countries who are being paid slave labor. And I have no doubt that that a lot of that's true. These people in Mexico and in different countries, including Asia, India, and so forth, a lot of these people are not being paid reasonable wages in terms of their buying power. Well, I believe in protectionism. I believe that we have a right to develop our manufacturing base. But no man is an island and no country is an island. We can't give up trading with other countries. And we should be looking at some of these countries to help them facilitate in a real way their economic development. What we've actually been doing, according to my understanding at this point, is what we've done is we've gone in there to these countries and we've we've offered them a lot of money. And this money might go into, say, building an infrastructure like an electrical infrastructure, building dams, helping them uh, maybe make some of their, their land, you know, taking down some of their forests and trees and building areas that can be used for, for crop growth and so forth. 
But the problem is, is that we're giving them this money and then intentionally, you know, the money is coming back here. We're basically giving them money to use a lot of United States or corporate affiliated types of companies uh, in order to help them with their infrastructure. So you have these multinationals and you have U.S. companies helping them and getting the money. And a small amount of this money actually trickles down to their own um, their own people to do the work. And when it does trickle down, it often trickles down to a few of the families or the few, some of the politicians who are richly rewarded for those services. This is a real problem. This is lending money to people and really giving and not letting them have the advantage for their own e- economic growth directly, but only for the infrastructure. But then here's the other problem. These loans are given probably with the understanding that they won't be able to pay them back. So these countries become like indentured servants of the United States because of this ability of ours to lend a lot of money, initially build the infrastructure, get paid for that, and then what happens next? Uh, They can't pay it back, so they have to make more concessions. This happened in Iraq, as an example. You have you know, all these companies coming in, making millions of dollars, and sometimes even, even really ripping off the U.S. government, our own company, our own companies in this country. And then later on, uh, hiring people, you know, outside independent contractors to do a lot of the work. So it doesn't help rebuild the economy of Iraq. And you have, uh, basically a country that has been destroyed economically. A lot of its infrastructure has been destroyed and needs to be rebuilt even now. So you have this problem of going into a country and so, so-called helping them, but actually indebting them, making them more reliant on the United States and having, yes, certain advantages in terms of their daily life. Yes, there can be advantages, but on the, on the whole, it's like letting people go to college, you know, and having them pay, you know, uh, a certain amount you know, borrow a certain amount of loans and then never letting them have some peace from these loans that they borrowed, which will linger with them for decades. I'm sure many of the people in our audience have are either students or have children who are students who are are loaded down with thousands and thousands of dollars of debt. Well, so are these countries. But to make it even worse, a lot of these countries would go into so-called help. And again, we'll go back into Afghanistan and and uh, particularly in Iraq, is we we just get involved in uh, so-called helping them militarily, and we help bring on all kinds of tremendous problems because of entering into a war situation where there are different groups in this country which are fighting with each other. So they're, therefore, we're destroying even more of their infrastructure, and we're in, possibly indebting them even more, plus draining our own resources on military activities that are not producing any kind of fruit, except for certain companies, U.S. companies and multinationals that are supplying the military apparatus. So you have a lot of problems here. One of the more bizarre aspects of what Trump has been saying He was talking to Anderson Cooper on another interview, and uh, basically he was, uh, they were talking about his request or desire to ban all Muslims coming to America, which is, uh, to me, tremendously ridiculous, and to many other people, actually to probably millions of people who are Americans who don't respect that type of absurdity. We have quite a few millions of Muslims here in America, and... uh, these people have been tremendously supportive of our efforts to rid ourselves of the jihadist assailants who are working throughout the world, not only to hurt America, but to hurt other Muslim groups within their, within the Islamic religion. So what Trump said, he wouldn't really withdraw his desire. He justified it by saying, well, they hate us. Well, on the actual um, debate, he was asked, I thought you had um, friends and clients who were Muslim. He said, yes. He said, do they hate us? No. Those people, he said, don't hate us. But all throughout the Muslim world, you have all these mosques, and these people are, you know, screaming out, death to America. And in general, yes, they hate us. That's basically what he was saying, which is not true. And I don't think that anybody else in the Republican debate actually thought it was true. It's very obvious from looking at what jihadists are uh, involved with, 
is that they hate other Muslims as well as they hate other countries. Al-Qaeda, before, uh, before ISIS, was destroying certain types of monuments belonging to, uh, belonging to Sh- Shiite groups, uh, the Shiite group, which is a, a different whole division of Islam that's popular in Iran and other countries. But um, ISIS is destroying artifacts, historical artifacts, architecture, uh, destroying different uh, archaeological ruins because they want to create a certain image of Islam, as well as killing in horrible ways people who are Muslim, but of a different point of view than they are. The, no- the normal Muslim world has been very friendly to the United States and been very supportive in many ways, including during the Gulf War. I'm not saying that there aren't problems. Certainly, one of the the most humorous parts is that after saying all these terrible things about not letting Muslims come here and so forth, he wants to be the negotiator for the Palestinian-Israeli peace settlement. And that, that's got to be the biggest joke of all. I said, well, <laughs> he, he isn't going to... Uh, endorse either uh, the Palestinian side or the Israeli side, and so he was attacked for not being siding with the Israelis. Well, the fact is, is that he sided against the uh, Palestinians just by virtue of their religion. Uh, He has absolutely no objectivity at all. And what he's done is he's endangered the United States because some of these people actually are going to, not the normal Islamic person, but there are certain people who are kind of on the edge in terms of being recruited by ISIS or other fanatical groups who, who might take him seriously. So in my platform, there is going to be absolutely no prejudice against any ethnic group or uh, religious group or group based on economics. It's going to be across the board that all men are created equal and entitled to a certain inalienable rights. That is the basis of my platform. My platform is all the good things that are created, that were created at the beginning of our Constitution and expanded later, that fulfill the American dream of prosperity, liberty, and justice for all, should be incorporated into every single way that we deal with other countries and their various cultures and religions. It has to be the way it it should be. That should be the way it's executed. The way that Thomas Paine, when he wanted to help other countries, said, we want to bring common sense and equality to other countries. Now, that doesn't mean we have to invade them if they don't (laughs) agree with us. But it means in dealing with them, we need to deal with them and their citizens in a just and fair way. And that means also not just dealing with their elites in their country, not just looking at the way we can make as much money by helping certain rich families or rich corporations in their country, but definitely looking at every single action of our foreign policy that's a benefit for all the people in those countries that we're dealing with. We'll be back later. Here is a short clip from Edgar Aaron's performance of his musical composition, I'll Go With You.
worked with Russian composer Edgar Aaron for quite a few years, building an inventory of songs, many of which feature singer-performer Patricia Welch. We will soon be releasing these songs, components of an album and a musical in progress called Hadley's Castle. When Edgar and I first got together, I was amazed by the brilliance of his musical scores created for movies, TVs, and animations. Here is a sample of the work he did on the Russian TV series, available now on Amazon, called The Secret Agent's Memoir, which had two seasons. This score is called Escape and was created for the first season. I am very pleased to say that Bridge of Light Productions, a division of New Galaxy Enterprises, is proud to be the contact point for television and film companies seeking information about this amazing composer's work. If you're in the entertainment business and wish to know more, contact me at johnnybluestar at gmail.com. That's johnnybluestar at gmail.com. The following is from West Side Warrior, the memoir of Ray Boylan, a Korean War veteran and crime fighter. He was there fighting in the world's coldest battlefield when the Chinese communists invaded. Desperate squad members ran past our foxhole yelling, Get the hell out of here! There's too many of them! Again, we saw the Chinese soldiers charge again with opium-induced mindlessness, oblivious of our bullets. Again, we heard the bugles and whistles. Climbing out of our foxhole, Bob dropped two hand grenades behind us, and I threw one over my shoulder. Bullets whizzing by our heads, Bob and I became bolts of lightning flashing across the mountainside. Like a hideous film, desperate scenes like this played out on the Tokong Pass for three days. Sometimes I played in the scene. Sometimes I could only watch and wonder if it were real, or if I'd be suddenly jolted out of my trance by an RKO usher saying, Hey, did you kids sneak in here? To acquire this book, Google westsidewarrior.boylan.kindle. Boylan is spelled B-O-Y-L-A-N. That's West Side Warrior, Boylan, Kindle. My company, New Galaxy Enterprises, is a California corporation specializing in the creation of media and promotional content. We are focused on original, innovative projects that are good for humanity. These projects could be non-fiction books or novels, fictional screenplays or documentary content, websites and website content, commercial advertising content for print, audio or video products on the internet, television or radio, musical scores for advertising, television or film, video, audio editing, etc. We want to promote products and projects that support the environment, encourage a healthy experience in living, developing, nurturing and useful technology and offering platforms for positive, socially constructive entertainment or informative, transformative media. Our experience in creating a variety of products like this is rather vast and we offer client-based and collaborative products as well as the opportunity of active investors to join us in the creation and promotion of proprietary products, some of which are in latter stages of development. For more information, go to www.newgalaxyenterprises.com Dot com. That's www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. If you're interested in talking to us, just fill out the contact sheet and we will get back with you. This is Johnny Blue Star back again on Threshold Radio for our last segment. We've been discussing my fantasy presidential campaign platform. And as I've mentioned, I don't have no intention of running for president. But I do have an intention for sort of starting a dialogue about certain ideas And in my own mind, trying to discern what kind of a paradigm do we need that represents a reasonable and powerful presidential platform for the future of our country. At this point, things seem so terribly wrong, it seems impossible. But if you do believe in God, and you believe in that intelligence, that power, and that source behind all things that can communicate and guide man, maybe it's not impossible. I'd like to uh, read a little bit from a book by Wayne Dyer called Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling. And from chapter four, which is called How It Feels to Return to Spirit, it begins with a quote from Aldous Huxley, which says, the aim and purpose of human life is the unitive knowledge of God. 
You see, what Wayne says is that we originated, quote, in a field of energy that has no boundary. Before entering the world of form, we were in spirit, a piece of God, if you will. And then he says we entered into this physical world as a particle, then a cell, then a fetus, an infant, and ultimately as a fully developed human being. But our purpose all along of this journey, he claims, was the unitive knowledge of God, as Huxley puts it. And then he says something very important to my concept of what I'm doing. He says, sadly, when we began our human training, we were taught to abandon most of our spiritual identity and adopt a new one based on ego consciousness or a sense of being separate from spirit. In other words, we came here from a place of inspiration and intended to stay that way. Unfortunately, we for- forgot to do so, and we ended up abandoning most of our in- inspiring notions in favor of a consensus of reality that didn't include spirit. We chose the false self, which is why we so inexplicably feel off purpose. You see, basically I believe that human beings were created to experience themselves, what Wayne calls in spirit, and that is consistent with certain ideas of consciousness or higher consciousness, a higher self, God consciousness, Christ consciousness, very many words used to convey that sense that there is a greater power of awareness that we can become tuned into, what I call walking in the garden. Now, I think that people have many different levels of understanding and experiencing this presence, which is which I believe Jesus was calling the kingdom of God and was called the Shekinah, or, or the presence of God in, the he, in Hebrew scriptures, but is, is mentioned in all scriptures of the world. Now, I believe that since many, many of us are immersed in what I would call a false sense of identity, that is, a sense of self that's deprived of the sense or experience of the source or God consciousness, that is why we have slipped into this abyss of nuclear weapons being aimed at each other, tremendous bouts with diseases, some curable, some incurable, all kinds of racial and ethnic conflicts, toxic Chemicals invading our sky and water, our food supply, our soil. Because what has what has gone wrong is that mankind has put things in front of them like money or power, which basically are not really acceptable when you walk into the world of spirit. I'm not trying to say that if you walk in the world of spirit, you won't be involved with money or you won't be involved with some kind of power. Those things are acceptable if you're walking in the garden. That is, if you're walking in the consciousness or presence of spirit. Now, I will say this. There are many people who maybe wouldn't say they experience, quote, being in spirit, like Wayne Dyer describes it. But I want to say that those people, if they have if a, a refined conscience, if they love other people, if they believe in goodness, if they even believe in the goodness of God without actually tangibly experiencing the Spirit. These people are aligned with the same sort of beliefs that our founding fathers had. They believed that all men were created equal, that they had inalienable rights. And these rights, yes, in the Constitution, suffrage is tremendously limited, and uh, freedom is tremendously limited since they were so many slaves. Uh, They were... They were largely white property uh, individuals, men who control things and extended their suffrage uh, to a um, representative democracy largely controlled by a minority. But as things progressed, this idea of all men being created equal rippled in the consciousness and conscience of generations that moved progressively towards expanding suffrage, which is a very good thing. I believe that the answer to... A lot of our problems is is the development and furthering of a population of enlightened and informed citizenry around the world. Yes, America, in many ways, even though it has had tremendous faults, tremendous corporate and government alliances that were aiming at basically pure profit and, and corrupted some of its relationships with other countries or many other countries, But still, there is a sense when you say I'm an American that you don't mean that part of us. You mean the part that Jefferson and Madison 
and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine and all these great founding fathers intrinsically meant in their hearts. We need to move forward the actual full manifestation of that reality. And that reality is within us. But in order to achieve anything, we need to develop a, a group of people, surely a minority, but a minority of enlightened and informed citizenry in the United States and elsewhere, that truly believes in their heart that these, these qualities of, of freedom, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom to be tried by, by a jury of your peers, freedom not to be tortured or abused or punished in some unusual and strange way, a freedom to, to be involved in a country where if you had to go to war, the people's voice would be heard through their representatives rather than an executive office, one executive person uh, deciding on engaging in a war that would involve thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of people. We need to get back to these core ideas, ideas which would never lead to taking people from other countries who were perhaps perceived to be enemies or thought or actually were, but not to treat those people as lower echelons, as lower echelon people, but to treat them the same way that all, all people are entitled to because they all have inalienable rights, not just Americans. American exceptionalism does not involve the subtraction of human rights and privileges from the rest of the world. In fact, it should be diligent, diligently enforcing those, those uh, principles. So I want to thank everybody here for listening to me, and uh, we'll be back on Threshold Radio very soon. Thank you. Originally, Zave Nathan came here from France, seeking work as an actor and musician in Hollywood. Now he and his wife, Bonnie Blazik, write unusual and impactful songs, often addressing critical issues facing humanity. You can hear their story and some of their exciting music in show number three with Zave Nathan and Bonnie Blazak in our Threshold Radio archives in VegasAllNetRadio.com and YouTube. Here is one of their songs. So they feel good. 
safe and happy They could have fooled me They could have fooled me Galaxy Enterprises is a media company specializing in wide-ranging content like novels, non-fiction books, screenplays, commercial advertising, web content, etc. One of our most esteemed providers is illustrator Robert W. Zalo. I work on all my most important projects like book covers, logos, web design elements with Robert. As an illustrator, he worked on the Ignatz-nominated comic book, The Expert's Guide to Killing Things That Go Bump in the Night. His skills encompass advertising, magazine illustrations, gaming, comic books, TV production, and scenic painting. His clients include Comcast, Adelphia, Haven Talent, Forceworks, High Octane Theater, Star Creative Advertising. If you wish to contact Robert, go to johnnybluestar.com and let me know. That's johnnybluestar.com. For artist, illustrator Robert Zalo, an essential component of all the work we do. Maybe he can help you too. Boots in Manhattan is a coming-of-age novel by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. It is about a young Tom Boots Raymond who grows up in New York in the 1940s who is a member of a street gang. My friends and I were about to start our own game of stickball when Rabbit Lacey, the head of the Rattlers, came up to us and tried to move in on our game. We were called dwarves, the youngest members of the stupid gang. Hey, Kevin, I need you to get some gloves and some stuff I left at my place. No, this is our game. Hey, are you my good little dwarf or what? You've been calling me a dwarf since I was six. We're not your personal slaves, pal. Hey, what is this? A dwarf rebellion? All right, big guy. We ditch the dwarf thing. We make you guys regular rattlers. No, it's too late. He looked at Jay and me. We looked away. Rabbit was now angry, and he pushed Kevin hard with the palms of his hand. Kevin tried to ram him in his stomach, but he stepped aside, throwing Kevin into the curb where he fell to the ground, <sighs> bleeding profusely at the knee. Still, he managed to get up. My street. Kevin shouted at Rabbit, pointing at him with an angry index finger. Find out more by Googling Boots in Manhattan, a 1940s coming-of-age novel, part one of the novel series The Foot Soldier by Ray Boylan and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. That's Boots in Manhattan, Ray Johnny Kindle. My company, New Galaxy Enterprises, is a California corporation specializing in the creation of media and promotional content. We are focused on original, innovative projects that are good for humanity. 
These projects could be nonfiction books or novels, fictional screenplays or documentary content, websites and website content, commercial advertising content for print, audio or video products on the internet, television or radio, musical scores for advertising, television or film, video, audio editing, etc. We want to promote products and projects that support the environment, encourage a healthy experience in living, developing, nurturing, and useful technology, and offering platforms for positive, socially constructive entertainment or informative, transformative media. Our experience in creating a variety of products like this is rather vast, and we offer client-based and collaborative products, as well as the opportunity of active investors to join us in the creation and promotion of proprietary products, some of which are in latter stages of development. For more information, go to www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. That's www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. If you're interested in talking to us, just fill out the contact sheet and we will get back with you. We go out with Zave Nathan's gentle celebration of a new morning, followed by a short clip of Zave Nathan and Bonnie Blazik's song, Change. Peace for all men and women, peace in all times.